All right, the part of the chapter that I'm going to focus on tonight is going to be Lamentations chapter 4, verse 1. But first, I'm going to give the context and the background of the book of Lamentations and of this chapter in particular. The book of Lamentations was authored by the prophet Jeremiah. And because of this book mainly, he's, he's ascribed the title as the weeping prophet. It is, it's a book written about the mourning that, uh, that Jeremiah records of the people of Jerusalem at the time that they're taken captive. And uh, the, the book was written immediately following or immediately after the Babylonian captivity. And originally, Jehoiakim was the king. Jehoiakim was the king not when they were, not when they were taken captive in this sense right here. What happened was, at the time Jehoiakim was king, Nebuchadnezzar came in. Nebuchadnezzar, he, he, uh, he came into the city and he only took with him at that time initially just Jehoiakim. And he only, the Bible records, says that he took, he took a few goodly vessels from the temple. And when he did that, he took Jehoiakim, Nebuchadnezzar took Jehoiakim from, from reigning, and he brought him back with him, and he put his brother Zedekiah in power. And his brother Zedekiah began to reign in Jerusalem. And after, after a period of time while, while Zedekiah was reigning in Jerusalem, he decided that he was going to turn against Nebuchadnezzar, and he decided that he was going to rebel against Nebuchadnezzar. Now, keep in mind that Zedekiah was very aware that the punishment and the oppression that was, that was come upon them from the Babylonian captivity was because of the sins of Judah. This wasn't a coincidence that they had come into captivity, that they were under oppression. It was because of the sins of the past. It was because of also the sins of the present time of, of Zedekiah himself, because he himself didn't humble, to the, humble himself to the preaching of Jeremiah. And it was ex, it very explicitly explained and clearly preached to him over and over again. And he was warned at one time after another time after another, you know, that, that, that he needed, you know, to, to submit unto the king, and he didn't. He rebelled. And when he did that, <clears throat> when he rebelled, this time Nebuchadnezzar came in and he didn't only make them pay tribute and he didn't only take the king with him. He came in and he completely destroyed the city, the Bible says. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 17, you don't have to turn there, I'm going to read it to you. This was the result. It says, Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age. <clears throat> he gave them all into his hand, and all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king, and of his princes. All these he brought to Babylon, and they burnt the house of God, and break down the wall of Jerusalem, and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire, and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And them, <clears throat> and them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. So originally with Jehoiakim, just Jehoiakim was taken and a few goodly vessels. And then and they would have lost their freedom, obviously, and they would have had to pay taxes, basically. But then here we see an entirely different outcome, a far, far worse outcome. He comes in and he just destroys the entire city. He lays the entire city desolate. He burns down the palaces, it says. He destroys the temple. And then not only that, he takes with him everybody. And, may, and anybody who's not killed with the sword, he takes with him. And they're made to be servants in his kingdom until the reign of Cyrus, king of Persia, when Ezra and Nehemiah and them begin to come back. So why did all of that happen? Because they added sin unto sin. See, they had a punishment to begin, to begin with. They had a punishment in the beginning, and they were warned long ago about this. And they decided to turn and not to hearken unto the warnings and not to hearken unto, you know, unto the preaching of God's word. <clears throat> so after being punished, after Judah turned from God once, you know, they were rebuked again. And then after that, they hardened their heart even more. So keep your hand in Lamentations chapter 4, thank you, and turn to 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 1, because Jerusalem wasn't a small city that was destroyed. You know, some people have in their mind for some reason that Jerusalem wasn't a very large city, but the Bible says when God established Solomon upon the throne that he exceeded all the kings of the earth in, in wisdom and in riches. Jerusalem was massive. At one point, it was the largest, you know, kingdom in the, in the, in the earth. It was the most powerful kingdom that was on this earth. And uh, this is another thing I want to point out. Just like, just like Jeremiah received warnings one after another after another, and even those warnings go all the way back to Solomon. Even at the time when God blessed, when God was blessing Israel, before it was even divided, 
God gave Solomon a warning immediately. He gave him a warning about what would happen if they would turn from God. And it says in 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 1, And it came to pass when Solomon had finished the building of the house of the Lord and the king's house and all Solomon's desire, which he was pleased to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time. So this is immediately when he's finished, as soon as he's done. As he appeared unto him at Gibeon, and the Lord said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication that thou hast made before me. I have hallowed this house which thou hast built to put my name there forever. And mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. And if thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded thee and will keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever." as I promised to David thy father, saying, excuse me, there shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. But if ye shall at all turn from following me, ye or your children, and will not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then will I cut off Israel out of the land which I have given them, and this house which I have hallowed for my name will I cast out of my sight, and Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all people and at this house which is high and at this house which is high every one that passeth by it shall be astonished and shall hish hiss and they shall say why hath the lord done thus unto this land and to his house and they shall answer because they forsook the lord their god who brought forth their fathers out of the land of Egypt and have taken hold upon other gods and have worshipped them and served them. Therefore hath the Lord brought upon them all this evil. So that explains so much about what we read in Lamentations 4. The reason why God you know, destroyed Jerusalem, the reason what they had done to cause God to be so angry. It actually almost verbatim talks about how Jerusalem looks at it, you know, or, or Jeremiah looks at Jerusalem. And he's like, how has the gold become dim? He's astonished when he sees it. And that is, that's almost verbatim mentioned here. But what I want to point, point out about this is, so immediately after the work was finished, immediately God appears unto him. And the first thing he does is he warns him. He gives him a warning right away, right off the bat. And he says, if, there's a condition, if thou wilt walk before me, then I will establish the, thy throne of thy, the throne of thy kingdom. And he says, but if ye shall at all turn from following me, I'll cut you off out of the land, he tells him. And that's the same thing that happened when the children of Israel inher inherited the land of Canaan. Immediately before they were even in the land, you know, he tells him, he, he said, I set before you this day life and death, blessing and cursing. They received the warning before they even went in. They received the warning while they were in the glory days. First, that, what, that, that warning wasn't given later. You know, God gives that warning. You know, obviously the preaching went on before, but the warning begins far before the consequence comes, far before it's time for judgment to be poured out. Now go back to Lamentations chapter 4. <clears throat> Lamentations chapter 4. <clears throat> Lamentations chapter 4 verse 1 <clears throat> reads, How is the gold become dim? How is the most fine gold changed? Now when it says gold right here, it's talking about the temple specifically. Look, <clears throat> look at the latter part. It says, the stones of the sanctuary are poured out in the top of every street. So he's talking about the stones of the sanctuary. He's talking about the temple specifically. And he makes that statement, how has the gold become dim? When the temple was built, almost all the building materials were taken and they were covered and they were decked in gold. Even the instruments were decked in gold and covered in gold. And that's the title of my sermon this evening is, how has the gold become dim? <clears throat> turn, turn quickly uh, to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 11. Now, we as New Testament Christians don't go to a physical temple to worship today. The temple was rebuilt after this, and it was destroyed again, never to be built, in 70 AD by the Roman Empire. So it hasn't been built yet again. It will be in the end times, you know, for the Antichrist to be there. <clears throat> but as of right now, the temple's not standing. We as New Testament believers don't go to a temple to worship. We do not. And another major change is that in the New Testament... The nation of Israel is not God's chosen people any longer. That nation is made up of all believers, of all nations. As long as you're a believer in Christ, you are a part of that, that holy nation or that peculiar people. And even, but this is what people miss. Even in the Old Testament, 
You know, there, is a sp there, there, was, there was representations at that time of spiritual things to come, of spiritual things to come. Different things, there was carnal ordinances which, which pointed to the future, you know, shadows of things to come. But people, for some reason, when they see the Old Testament, they think it's all just carnality. They, they think it's all just about the temple and all physical things. But Jerusalem was meant to be the spiritual capital of the world at that time. That's where, that's where all the nations of the world would go to to learn about God, to seek the Lord if they wanted to. And now in the New Testament, there are things in the Old Testament that were physical. You know, they were spiritual in a sense, but they, they were instituted for a reason to point towards spiritual things. Look in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. <clears throat> it says, Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, promise <clears throat> having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, <coughs> having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you, which were afar off and to them that were nigh. So as the Bible, we see the Bible teaches right here, and as we've read in many other places, in Galatians, numerous other places, Romans, the Bible teaches that it's no longer the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, but God has a nation that's put together of all believers. That's the first point I want to I wanna, I wanna focus on. And then the second point I'm going to point out about this passage, we're going to begin reading again in verse 18. It says this, <clears throat> For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, this, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So in the New Testament... The temple has been replaced with the local church. That's what the Bible teaches. You, we no longer go to a temple, a physical temple to worship. You know, the church is not uh, this building. The church is a local assembly, a local congregation of believers which all have the Holy Spirit. We all are the habitation of God through us. That's what the Bible teaches. So the temple in the New Testament is believers. It's congregations. It's the local church. And then also, it's not the nation of Israel that's God's chosen people. That, again, is believers. It's the local congregation, saved Christians in the New Testament. And Romans chapter 15, verse 14 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. The things of the Old Testament are, were written to teach us, were teach us in the New Testament. So what we do is we take, we take the institutions of the New Testament, we take the temple... Uh, our temple here, the congregation of believers, we take the local church, which is the peculiar people, the holy nation, and we apply that to verses we read in the Old Testament. Like when we see in Lamentations chapter 4, verse 1, it says, How is the gold become dim? The Bible says, For all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. We look at those things and we apply those unto all unto us today. That's written to Faithful Word Baptist Church is what it's written to. And it says, how has the gold become dim? Now, first, let me make myself clear. I don't think that the light that's shining at Faithful Word is becoming dim. That's not what I believe. I believe this is the greatest church in the world and I believe it's growing. I believe it's getting bigger and I believe it's at the beginning of its glory days. I honestly, honestly believe that from the bottom of my heart. But, you know, Jeremiah didn't come and just start warning them at the end. Jeremiah, God gave the warning to Solomon in the very beginning. God gave that warning to Israel right before they came into the promised land, before it even began. You know, as soon as they were in their glory days, that's when they received that, that, uh, that, that warning. <clears throat> 
And if you sit here today and you hear this and you say, you know, I don't need, this isn't something I need to hear because faithful word is just booming. Faithful word is striving. This isn't something that I need to hear today. The Bible says, therefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. You better take heed to the Bible today. You know what? This is written to the Zedekiahs. That's who it's written to. The people who are puffed up with pride. That's who it's written to. It's written to the people. Zedekiah, what we're going to look here in just a minute. The whole reason that that nation fell was because of pride. It's because of arrogancy. When they're in their time of prosperity, when they're in their time of blessing, when they're in their time and they're thriving, you know, what happens is they end up getting lifted up. They end up becoming arrogant and they don't think nothing can happen to them. If you think that today while you're in here in this, and you're sitting in this auditorium, you're more vulnerable than anybody else. Yeah, right. You're the one that's going to fall. You're the one that's going to be brought down. Turn, turn, if you will, to Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. <clears throat> 1 Chronicles 36, 11, I'm going to read to you real quick about Zedekiah. And it tells you why that, that destruction came up, upon Jerusalem. It says... Zedekiah was one and twenty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned eleven years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God, and humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God. But he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. So you know what the problem with Zedekiah was? It was pride. That was what, what brought Zedekiah down. That was, the, that was the last straw that brought him down. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 25, I'll read to you, says, The Lord will destroy the house of the pride, of the proud, but he will establish the border of the widow. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, where you are, says, Pride <clears throat> goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. The first step for the gold to become dim is pride, is to get lifted yeah. up. When that gold is shining bright, if you start thinking, man, we're good, just like Nebuchadnezzar, I did all this on my own, you know, and forget the Lord your God, that's the first step for the gold to become dim. That's the first step to lose the spiritual light of the world. That's the first step for the darkness to come. Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased. And he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. We need to have a humble attitude. Turn, if you will, to uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24. <clears throat> so pride is the first step for the gold to become dim. So we need to have a humble heart. Number two, the, the second thing that we need is we have to have the right foundation as a local church. As a New Testament church, we have to have the right foundation. And that's the most important part. That is the most important part of a temple. If you think of a temple when it's built, you know, obviously in the temple they have the pillars of the temple, which is also a supporting structure. But those pillars have to have a good foundation to sit upon first or they're useless. They're worthless. They have to have a solid foundation that they're built upon. I'm going to read you Ephesians 2 again where we just read, but I'm going to point out, point out a different aspect of it at this point. It says uh, in, in verse 19, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. That's talking about the word of God is what that's talking about. That's talking about the Bible. That's talking about the writings of the Old Testament of the prophets, and it's talking about the writings of the New Testament of the apostles. And then Jesus Christ is the word. In the beginning was the word. If you look in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, where you are, this is Jesus speaking. He says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them... I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the, rains and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them shall be likened, un shall be, shall be likened unto a foolish man. Doeth them not. I'm sorry, that was where I messed up. And doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. The New Testament church has to be founded upon the words of God, upon the sayings of Jesus Christ. That has to be our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Anything that we do in our lives, every aspect, we have to found it upon the word of God and upon the Bible. That has to be the rock and the foundation of the local church and of, and of the... Uh, <clears throat> of the, the temple. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 13 says, 
till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Too many Christians today don't know their Bible enough and they're being deceived. That's what's going on all the time. They're not personally doing the Bible reading. The pastor can stand up here all day long and teach you and what you can do is go back to other people and just you know regurgitate the things you've heard. But I'll tell you where it separates the men from the boys is when somebody has a question for you and then you're able to say, you know, I can prove to you from the Bible why the rapture comes after the tribulation. I can not only use his words, but I'll explain in my words why what, whatever you believe is false. Amen. That's, that's where we need to be as Christians. We all need to be rooted and grounded in the Word of God. The local New Testament church, this thing, this, you know, this sermon applies to the church, like I said, but the church, like it, a minute ago we saw in Ephesians, it's fitly framed together of all different stones, of all different, uh, you know, of all different parts of members of the body, like the Bible talks about in the local church. So each individual has to apply this to themselves, and they have to say, I'm going to personally learn the Bible for myself. I'm going to be grounded. I'm going to be rooted on the foundation of the Word of God. <clears throat> Turn, if you will, quickly to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. <clears throat> if you don't have the right foundation, you're going to crumble, just like the, the foolish man, just like the foolish man that built his house upon the sand. <clears throat> the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay, than that which is laid, than, than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 6, verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. So first, we must be humble, number one. Number two, we must have the right foundation. And then number three, another way that our light can become dim, another step to the light becoming dim at Faith Forward Baptist Church or at any church is by not sanctifying ourselves, not setting ourselves apart from the world, not living a different life than the world, and not just for the sake of being different, but not living the sinful life that, that the world lives. I'm going to read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. The Bible says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? So in the Old Testament, the reason why the temple was considered you know, the temple, why it had such importance and such value was because that's where, that was God's habitation. That was where God dwelled. And then, you know, before that, obviously, God dwelled in the tabernacle and it was set apart. It was sanctified. That's where the sanctuary came from. You know, at that point, the sanctuary was in the tabernacle. That's what set it apart. In the New Testament, as believers, when we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior, we receive eternal life, which is the Holy Spirit. The Bible says in Romans 8, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. When we receive that, we're sanctified and we're set apart. And God has different standards held for us than, he, than, than for anyone. You know, we are different than the world. And we are supposed to live different than the world. Like I said, not just for the sake of being different, but we're not supposed to listen to the same filth that the world listens to. We're not supposed to watch the same trash that the world watches. We're not supposed to just follow in the same footsteps, doing the same sinful things that the world does. And, uh, and, and that's what it means to be set apart, to be sanctified. If you look down at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, the Bible says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? <clears throat> and what communion hath light with darkness? I'm going to turn there because I didn't copy and paste the whole thing. I'm going to read more, more of it. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, verse 15. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And then watch this. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Our best friends should be people from church. The people that we hang out with the most, the people that we're the closest to, should be people from our local church. People that are saved believers that are like-minded like we are. Yeah. You know, and if your best friend is some unsaved like heathen from, you know, from work or something like that, then I can already tell you you have a spiritual problem in your life. 
Because the Bible, you know, not the Bible, I was getting ready to say the Bible says this, birds of a feather flock together. You know, people, <laughs> the Bible doesn't say that. But, bird, you, know, you know, the Bible says this, though. Uh, it says in, uh, in, I think, Amos, can two walk together except they be agreed? I just came up with the top of my head, too. <laughs> so can two walk together except they be agreed? You know, the only way you're going to hang out with people is if you have things in common with them. Right. You know, that's the only way that they're your best buddies, that they're your best friends. So, you know, the people at my work, I couldn't even be best friends with. You know, I'm not saying I'm pious, but I love the Bible and I love singing hymns. And, I, and you're going to want to be around people that do those same things. Yeah. You're going to and if you're a young man or if you're a young woman and you're thinking about marrying sometime shortly, the last thing that you should be looking is out in the world. You should be coming to church and looking around at church for prospects or whatever you want to call it. You know, you should be wanting to get married to other believers, other like-minded people, people that believe the Word of God and, they, and you know, they want to live the same kind of life that you want to live. They want to live a separate life. They want to live a sanctified life. They want to serve God with their time. Turn to uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. <clears throat> Even in the Old Testament, like I was saying, we apply things of the nation of Israel, the Old Testament, unto us because we've replaced them. You know, the New Testament, it's the believers. And even in the Old Testament, the nation of Israel is told not to intermingle with the heathen. And why does he say that? Because you'll learn their ways. Yes. You don't want to be around them because you'll start acting like them. Yep. You don't want to be around them. You don't want to hear. And, you know, <clears throat> here, we'll, we'll go ahead and read. I'll actually, I'm going to read to you James chapter 4, verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That's strong words. That's very strong words. The Bible says in 1 John 2.15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. We shouldn't love the things of this world. Even the people of this world. I, you know, obviously, we should care about them, but it shouldn't be in the sense that they're our best friends. You know, we should separate ourselves from them. We, you know, they shouldn't be, all our time should not be spent hanging out with people of the world. You know, we should spend our time with believers, with like-minded people. We should live a set-apart and a sanctified life. And a good example you know, of, of, of the separation of the temple if you, if you remember in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah leaves for a period of time, like around like chapter 10 or something. And then he comes back. And when he comes back, he finds out that this guy, Tobiah, has set up shop or he's camping out in this chamber. And when he, when he goes in there, he just knows, number one, this guy shouldn't be here. So he goes into the temple and he literally starts grabbing all of this guy. And the Bible says his household stuff. So he's grabbing like his bed, like his chairs, his clothes, and he goes outside and just throws it outside. And he just tosses it outside. And that's what we should do. I'm not saying literally grab people and throw them. You know what I mean? But I'm saying the stuff in, the stuff in your life, if it shouldn't be there, get rid of it. Amen. The stuff in your mind, you know, the, if you've got a television, if whatever it is that, you know, you're turning on, you're listening to stuff you shouldn't be listening to, get it out of your life. You know the next thing that, that, that it says after that? It says, Nehemiah then commanded them to cleanse the temple. You know, that's the washing of the water by the word. <clears throat> and then immediately following that, they start taking in the goodly vessels and putting them back in. There wasn't enough room for both. They couldn't have both. It had to be one or the other. So they cleaned it out, and then they started bringing it in. If you want to start learning, you know, things that are pure, you can't have all that defiled stuff in your mind. You got to clean your mind out. You got to get rid of that junk. You got to you got to change your entire thinking. You have to change your philosophy of the way you live your life. That's the that's the third way that the gold will become dim. You know, in in the local church. That's the third way. Turn in your Bibles to uh, <clears throat> the next passage is Matthew chapter four verse sixteen. Matthew chapter four verse sixteen. <clears throat> this is the fourth way that the gold can become dim, and it's by hiding the light. It's by covering the light. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 16, The people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Then verse 17 that I'm going to read to you. You actually, I'm sorry, you can just turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. Just flip over one page. And then uh, it says, and then it's going to tell you actually what that light is. It says, From that time Jesus began to preach, and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The light is the gospel. Look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, and it's our job to, to preach the gospel. It says, ye are the light of the world. A city that is, that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Excuse me. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men 
that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. Luke chapter 12, verse 3 says, Therefore whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear, <coughs> that's that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. So our light, our light that we have today is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The light that we have as New Testament believers, and we were, we were commanded not to hide it, not to put it under a bushel. We're commanded, Jesus Christ said in, in Mark 16, he said, go therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We're commanded to go out and share the gospel with everyone. He says, go out into the highways, into the hedges, and compel them to come in that my house may be full. And you know, there's churches that we probably drive by today, and we look at them and they look run down, or maybe you visit a church sometime and you're like, man, that church is dead. And you probably think in your mind, this church has probably always been spiritually dead. But you don't know that. That church could have been Faith Forward Baptist Church 20 years ago. You have no idea. You don't have any clue. And pride is the attitude that says that that will never happen to me. Pride is the first step to that, thinking that can never be us. But there's churches you drive by today that have 20 members that might have had 150, 200 members five years ago and were soul winning. You have no idea. There are churches, there are definitely churches today somewhere. I don't know what churches they are where, where their light has become dim. And they were at one time, you know, a stronghold. They were at one time going out and preaching the gospel. And they had visions like Faithful Word Baptist Church had. There were, there, I'm sure there are many churches like that. Many churches. So we need to have these attitudes. We need to institute these things and make sure that, you know, we're letting our, our light shine. We need, to do, we need to analyze ourselves and make sure, you know, are we headed down that same path? that maybe that Zedekiah went down or maybe that Israel went down. And you know what? I don't think faithful word is as a whole, but maybe you might be personally. You might be personally, you might be lacking in your spiritual life. You might be going soul winning less than you used to go soul winning. Your light might not be shining the way that it should. Maybe not, maybe not everyone in here, but I'm sure there's somebody. So everybody needs to look at themselves and say, hey, you know, I, I don't want to go down that path. You know, I want to be here when the glory days are going and I want to be a part of it. You know, I want to be going out soul winning. I want, to be in, I want to be getting people saved along with everybody else. You know, I want to be, you know, when, when Faith Word Baptist Church is talked about in eternity and we're talked about about the great things that we did, I want to be here while it was going on. And I don't want to only be here, I want to be a part of it. Turn to your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And this is my last point. I'm going to end here. So before the temple was built, I alluded to this a minute ago, before the temple was built by Solomon, they had the tabernacle. And the, the, big, the biggest difference between the temple and the tabernacle is that the temple's permanent and the tabernacle is temporary. The, the, the tabernacle was meant to be set up and moved and taken to other locations and then, you know, set up and then moved. And, and you know, when you, when you build a foundation, when you put pillars up, you're not moving the temple. So that's the largest difference between the temple and the tabernacle. Now, in the New Testament, believers in the church are spoken as as the temple, and they're also spoken as the tabernacle. Our bodies are talked about in that sense. And each time they're talked about as the tabernacle, I'm going to show you two of the times they're talking about the tabernacle, is to show you know, the temporal aspect of it. It's to show that our bodies are just temporary, that it's not permanent, that we're not going to be on this earth forever. In first, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 13, I'll read to you. Peter says, Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. Now watch what he says knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, <clears throat> even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, again, Paul makes the same point. He illustrates the same point. He says in verse 1, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So he's talking about, he's contrasting that with our body, which is, which is temporary. And he says in verse 2, For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. 
For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And then he says this, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. We're going to stand before God one day. And he gave us the honor of having the Holy Spirit, and he referred to our bodies as the temple. And here he talks about it as the tabernacle because it's temporary, because we're not going to be on this earth forever. And we're going to stand face to face with the creator of this earth. And we're going to look in his eyes and he's going to look at us and he's going to judge us. Not by, regular, not by any regular standards, but by the fact that you know, our bodies was the tabernacle. What we, what we did, based upon what we did in our bodies in the short period of time while we were here, God is going to judge us. Whether, whether we built upon that foundation of the temple, wood, hay, or stubble, or whether we built upon that foundation, you know, precious stones like the Bible talks about in 1 Corinthians 3, and it talks about silver, and it talks about gold. And we, as the, as the local church, we need to make sure that our light continues to shine. We don't need to say, hey, you know, we're complacent. We're good here, you know. I feel like, I feel like I'm spiritually strong. I don't feel like I need to grow anymore. We need to make sure, we need to keep pushing and not looking back. And we need to make sure that we're, you know, number one, not going backwards. But number two, we need to have bigger dreams, bigger visions. And we need to, you know, we need to, we need to make sure that the, that, that day when we stand before God, that it's not going to be a day of sadness, that it's going to be a, you know, it's going to be a day of rewards because you're only on this earth for a little short time. You know, this is just a tabernacle that we're wearing. So let's go ahead and bow our heads and we'll have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord God, for, uh, for the privilege of, of, of having the Holy Spirit, dear Lord, and eternal life, dear God. And we thank you, dear Lord, for all the blessings that Faithful Word uh, has, dear Lord, with the great church that we have here, the greatest in the world. And we ask you just to continue to bless us, Father God. We ask you just to continue to be with us and, uh, and to uh, help us to uh, let our light shine, help us to follow your word, help us not to be proud, proud dear Lord God. Help us to humble ourselves and, and to use your word as our foundation. Help us to sanctify ourselves and to set ourselves apart, dear Lord God. And we love you so much and just be with us, as I said, and protect us. And, and, uh, in Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen. <clears throat>